Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Maryland police reveal how they got to arrest the man accused of trying to murder Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. They received a 911 call from the man himself. The House today broke a month-long delay and passed a bill to ramp up security for Supreme Court justices. This as protests continue in anticipation of the Roe v. Wade ruling. Planned Parenthood is hiring additional staff to navigate the influx of women they expect will travel out of state to get abortions. A family advocate says it's all part of a bigger scheme. The head of one of the most prestigious think tanks in the U.S. is resigning. The FBI is accusing him of illegally lobbying on behalf of a foreign country. We'll tell you which one. The United States Army turned 247 today. Many people gathered in Times Square to celebrate. NTD spoke with some of the soldiers there and with a new recruit. We have more updates on the man accused of trying to murder Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh last week. According to police, the suspect called 911 on himself and said during the call that he needed psychiatric help. Authorities say that Nicholas Roski texted his sister and she convinced him to call 911. Roski then called 911 and told the dispatcher his plans. This is according to the Washington Post, citing the Montgomery County police chief. His phone call with 911 lasted about 15 minutes. In it, Roski said he had been having violent thoughts for a long time and came to act on them. The California man also said that for a long time he had been hospitalized multiple times and could hear police sirens currently. He added that he needs psychiatric help. Police arrived at the scene soon after the call and arrested, arrested Roski. He was carrying a gun, a knife, ammunition, zip ties and other gear. And on Capitol Hill today, lawmakers sent a bipartisan bill to the president's desk. It's to grant more security to Supreme Court justices' family members. This as protests continue outside their homes and emotions run high just ahead of the court's official ruling on Roe v. Wade. NTD's Melina Weiskup has the story. The House today broke a month-long delay and passed a bill to ramp up security for Supreme Court justices and their family members giving the Supreme Court the same level of security that's given to Congress and the White House. Now it's off to the White House for the president's signature. By passing this bill as is, we are sending a clear message to the left-wing radicals. You cannot intimidate the Supreme Court justices. Most of the Congress members, both Democrat and Republican, voted yes, but there were 27 Democrats who voted no. It's a talking point. It's not because it really does anything. It's simply a talking point. A talking point? The left is telling people where Justice Barrett's kids go to school. That is not a talking point. That is a fact. This move in Congress comes as the Supreme Court is set to release its final ruling on an abortion case this summer. And just days after an armed man was arrested near the home of Justice Brett Kavanaugh and charged with attempted murder. Pro-abortion activists have continued to protest around D.C. And the Epoch Times reports that activists have said they aren't ruling out violence. One longtime activist saying, quote, if you want to do property destruction, do it in secret. If you're doing it publicly, you're probably an infiltrator. When asked about protesters' comments and the potential for violent activists, the Democrat caucus chairman told NTD's Iris Tau that they condemn violence. Whether it comes from whatever particular ideological perspective. And just last night, protests continued in front of Justice Alito's home. The Supreme Court is expected to release a slate of opinions tomorrow, but there's no details on which specific cases they'll be ruling on. So we'll have to wait and see tomorrow if the Supreme Court decides to publicly announce its official ruling for this historic abortion case. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. And as the Supreme Court is expected to overturn Roe v. Wade, Planned Parenthood has started hiring additional staff to prepare for an influx of women seeking abortions in states that permit them. But some family advocates say the organization is breaking up traditional families. And TD's Arlene Richards reports. 
If the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, at least 26 states are expected to ban abortions. That means women restricted by abortion bans will have to travel to another state to get an abortion, which could be costly. But Planned Parenthood has a plan to address an expected spike in women seeking abortions outside their home states. The nonprofit is building up its staff. The new hires, called patient navigators, will contribute to an already informal system that helps patients find the closest and earliest appointments. Nicole Hunt, a spokesperson for Focus on the Family, says women are seeking alternatives to abortion, but Planned Parenthood is preserving its business model. So this um, scheme that Planned Parenthood has, you know, in my opinion, is nothing more than just the next step it has to take to continue to support uh, its money-making industry, which is abortion. If people can't get abortions, then Planned Parenthood goes out of business. The patient navigators will also coordinate funding to pay for travel, medical, and child care costs. The funding comes from donors like the National Abortion Federation, a professional association of abortion providers. Since May, the NAF has spent 80 percent of its travel assistance funding to help women leave Texas to get out-of-state abortions. And there are private donors like billionaire philanthropist Mackenzie Scott, who made a single donation of $275 million, the largest gift ever made to Planned Parenthood. Eugene Delgadio, president of Public Advocate USA and Hunt, believe in the biblical teachings of what marriage and family mean, that children should be born into families, and if a child is born that a family can't care for, another family can adopt it. But abortion, they say, is an attack on families. We have had this chaotic, fabricated premise that women, meaning wives, can go out and get abortions. And marriages have been destroyed because of that free love concept without any consequences. We believe that strong families make strong communities and that strong families begin in the home. It begins with rearing children uh, in, in, in ways that you believe culturally and beliefs that you have spiritually. Uh, it's the development of the next generation. The NAF has also expanded its support teams to accommodate heavier patient loads at Planned Parenthood facilities in Illinois and other states. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. And on a different note, the head of one of the most prestigious think tanks in the U.S., the Brookings Institution, resigns. The FBI is investigating him for allegedly lobbying on behalf of a foreign government illegally. Here are the details. My fellow Americans from the battlefield. Retired Marine Corps four-star General John Allen resigned on Sunday as the president of the Brookings Institution. He held the position from late 2017. The FBI last week seized Allen's electronic data and said he made false statements about his role lobbying on behalf of Qatar. Court filings say that Allen helped Qatar influence U.S. foreign policy in 2017 when the Middle Eastern nation was in a diplomatic crisis. The FBI also claimed that the general simultaneously pursued multi-million dollar business deals with the government of Qatar. The FBI's search warrant application says the general violated a law on foreign lobbying, known as the Foreign Agents Registration Act. The act requires people who are lobbying for a foreign government to register with the Justice Department. According to the Associated Press, the general has previously denied working as a Qatari agent. Allen retired from the military in 2013. Before that, he spent years serving in the Middle East, including as the commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan and the deputy commander of the U.S. Central Command. He has not been charged with any crime. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. And now to the U.S. economy. How is it doing? The president today says he's very optimistic, while Republicans don't seem to agree. NTD's Iris Tao has more on the heated debate. Despite inflation soaring at a 40-year high, the president says... I've never been more optimistic about America than I am today. I really mean it. Addressing the economy on Tuesday, President Biden insisted that his economic policies are working and are going to work better once inflation is out of the way. I truly believe we've made extraordinary progress by laying a new foundation for our economy which becomes clear once global inflation begins to recede. 
He also accuses Republicans of blocking his progress while attacking what he calls a MAGA agenda as part of his midterm messaging. I believe in bipartisanship, but I have no illusions about this Republican Party, the MAGA Party. But Republicans say it's the other way around. Republicans have been laying out these answers for over a year. What we need is a president who's willing to listen. Those answers, they say, include drilling more in the U.S. to lower gas prices as opposed to turning to Saudi Arabia. Joe Biden, you do not need to go to Saudi Arabia to find a way to produce more energy. It's right here in America. The criticism comes as the White House officially confirms that Biden will visit Saudi Arabia next month and meet with the country's de facto leader, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. It has to do with much larger issues than having to do with the energy. While Biden has denied that it's aimed at getting the Saudis to pump more oil, the trip to the world's largest crude oil exporter is widely seen as a bid to lower energy prices at home. That said, in addition to Republicans, some Democrats are also voicing concerns over the visit, citing the kingdom's human rights record. Hey, Mr. President, you can't trust these people. Their standards are not our standards. Their values are not ours. And in response to a string of troubling inflation reports, the Federal Reserve is reportedly considering surprising the market this week by hiking interest rates by three quarters of a point, a measure unseen since 1994. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. And in national defense, the United States Army today turns 247. And many people gathered in Times Square to celebrate. NTD's Jason Perry spoke to some of the soldiers there and also a new recruit. We are all the, same under the, sun. the West Point band got the crowd warmed up with a few songs to kick off the celebration. Brigadier General John Cushing is a deputy commanding general and he is responsible for the operations of the U.S. Army Recruiting Command worldwide. Born on June 14, 1775, when the Continental Congress established it, the Army is a year older than the Declaration of Independence and 13 years older than the Constitution. He then administered the oath of enlistment for 24 future soldiers. Then the Army drill team showed off their skills for the crowd. And it wouldn't be a birthday party without cake. Staff Sergeant Michonne Cox migrated from Guyana in South America. She now runs the recruiting station in Mount Vernon, New York. So joining the Army, um, I've acquired my master's in criminal justice. That's one of the big things without any student loan. Um, I've traveled, I've moved around, um, I've owned a couple of houses, um, paid off a couple of cars. Um, so those are some of the main things that appeal to me because I do have two younger sons that I want to leave something behind for later on. Staff Sergeant Naomi Graham joined the Army as an ammunition specialist and she's now with a detachment called the U.S. Army World Class Athlete Program, and she's boxing for the Army and Team USA. The Army is the greatest decision that I ever made. Um, it supports me in anything that I need, uh, health care, school, and now I'm doing something that I'm very passionate about, being able to box while serving my country is the greatest thing I could have ever done. First off, then I got a chance to speak to one of the newest recruits. Joining because uh, my grandfather was a lieutenant general in my country, back in my country in Namibia. So it's uh, also a family thing. Like nobody ever joined the army after my grandfather. So I felt like I should do it. Lieutenant Colonel Harold Morris is the commander of the New York City U.S. Army Recruiting Battalion. He explained what the army's birthday is all about. Uh, it's an opportunity to recognize the sacrifice of soldiers that came before me and an opportunity to recognize the service of the soldiers that are currently serving. After 247 years, the Army is still alive and well. And something interesting about the numbers 247, many people have been saying today that the Army defends America 24-7. Here at Times Square in New York, Jason Perry, NTD News. Looks like a lively event. Coming up, U.S. crypto exchange platform Coinbase is laying off nearly one in five workers, warning of a possible crypto winter. And Elon Musk's new hurdles in his mission to send a rocket to Mars. Federal regulators announced dozens of actions required for the SpaceX Starship to launch. Stay tuned for more when we come back. Nation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. 
our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. Crypto exchange Coinbase is laying off 18% of its employees, or roughly 1,100 jobs. This comes as the digital currency market continues to crumble. CEO Brian Armstrong warned a recession could be imminent, which could lead to a long crypto winter. And he said the layoffs are to manage cost and ensure operation in any environment. He admitted that Coinbase grew too quickly last year. Crypto trading boomed then, and Coinbase grew from having 1,250 employees to 5,000 today. And now they have to downsize. So are there more layoffs to come? When asked that today, Coinbase COO told CNBC this will be it. Coinbase's stock is down around 80% this year. It relies on crypto trading for revenue. And now the overall crypto market has lost two-thirds of its value since last year's high point. Now, besides crypto exchanges, crypto investors are the ones really hurting. And TD's Phil Zoe spoke to some crypto investors who recently saw some of their holdings diminish to almost nothing. Riley Armand is a math expert. She's been tutoring students in math and science for nearly 10 years. On the side, she has a passion for creating sculptures and art. But during the CCP virus pandemic in 2020, she had more time on her hands and decided to get into crypto. Everyone kind of stopped going outside as much. I pivoted my tutoring business to look at like Web3, basically. Armand felt her transition into the crypto industry would be easy. Private tutoring was like my main thing. And now, honestly, I use a lot of the skills that I learned to help educate people about like Web3. So I think it served me really well. I think learning math will never hurt you. But this transition also included buying some cryptocurrency herself. And some of her crypto holdings, including the Solana coin, have dropped over 90% from their record highs. I know that we said like, oh, it's a 90% loss, but like there is still room for another 90% loss, unfortunately, if it gets to be like a very bad bear market recession. Alex Chambers is owner and designer at Wonder Web Development. He first got into crypto in 2017, but got out shortly after the market crash a year later. It would have been nice to sell previously, but... I have faith it'll keep growing in the future. Chambers got back into crypto recently during the bull run in 2021. But basically right now, anyone who invested during that 2021 period, there's a good chance that they're down. At one time, Chambers was holding around $20,000 worth of the Phantom coin. But after a 90% correction, that holding is now worth only a few thousand dollars. It sounds like really logical to be like, I'm going to cash out everything I have and stick it into crypto. Uh, but doing that presents the problem of being where we are right now. Some investors were wrecked to the point of wanting to take their own lives. In a recent post, a Reddit user said, My friend and ex-colleague tried to commit suicide this morning. The crypto market has crashed over 60% to under $1 trillion in value, a far cry from its nearly $3 trillion market cap during its peak last year. Phil Zhou, NTD News. Many challenges there. Well, another type of setback. Before Elon Musk can launch a spaceship to Mars, he must comply with certain environmental requirements. Federal regulators announced Monday more than 75 actions he'll have to take. NTD's Fake Quarter has more. Elon Musk's planned Starship launch in Boca Chica, Texas, is facing heavy regulation. Regulators are forcing him to take over 75 actions to decrease environmental impact before he can take off. Starship is SpaceX's most powerful launch vehicle, taller than a football field and wider than a bus. Musk wants to use it to send people to Mars after going through the 75 actions, which include contracting a qualified biologist to conduct pre-, during-, and post-construction monitoring of vegetation and birds, conducting evening lighting inspections between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. during sea turtle nesting season to make sure the lights don't affect the turtles, and operating an employee shuttle between Brownsville and the project site to reduce the number of vehicles on the road. The degree to which it's been taken is so extreme uh, and there's really almost no way to 
justify it unless you're just really anti-impact, like you're, unless you really don't want to see things get built. Brent Bennett is policy director of Life Powered at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Bennett says the permitting time it takes to get stuff like this done is damaging the economy. Other items include performing quarterly beach cleanups, providing improved, enhanced, or new access for fishing opportunities in the Gulf of Mexico, and participating in at least one public event every year that focuses on joint SpaceX, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and National Park Service Mission Outreach. This is completely unnecessary, especially when one considers that SpaceX is the only thing keeping right now the United States in the space race with China. In China, they don't have to go through this sort of red tape. Brandon Weikert is a space policy expert and the author of Winning Space, How America Remains a Superpower. Weikert believes the Biden administration is punishing Musk for being against it and having opposing views. The environmental review is only one part of the license application process. SpaceX will also have to go through FAA safety, risk, and financial responsibility requirements before Starship can take off for Mars. Faye Quarter, NTD News. And an innovation on a smaller scale, millions of Americans suffer from alopecia areata. It's an autoimmune disease which causes hair loss, but the FDA has now approved the first ever treatment for the disorder. And it treats the entire body, not just a specific bald patch. Mandy Gaither has more on what this means for those who struggle with this disease. This is a historic day for the alopecia areata community. It's called Illumiant, a pill taken by mouth, the first ever treatment for alopecia areata that's gotten the green light from the FDA. Imagine having this disease, a disease that alters your appearance practically overnight, and you've never had treatment options until now. Alopecia areata is a common autoimmune disorder where the body attacks hair follicles, often causing hair to fall out in clumps. The FDA says Illumiant blocks an enzyme that leads to inflammation that can trigger the body's response. The drug manufacturer held two clinical trials, including patients with at least 50% scalp hair loss for more than six months. Those given four milligrams of the treatment daily saw the most improvement. In the first trial, 35% of more than two 280 patients had what was described as adequate scalp hair coverage compared to 5% given a placebo. In the second trial, 32% of more than 230 patients who got 4 milligrams had positive hair growth compared to 3% of the 156 patients who got a placebo. It provides choice and it provides hope for the patient community. Common side effects included an upper respiratory tract infection, acne, high cholesterol, urinary tract infection, fatigue, yeast infections, anemia, abdominal pain, shingles, and weight gain. The treatment also comes with a boxed warning for serious infections, mortality, malignancy, major heart events, and thrombosis. The treatment was initially approved by the FDA to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Doctors also sometimes use it to treat patients hospitalized with COVID-19. And in weather, in Northern California, a thunderstorm brought rainfall. The storm brought some much-needed rain, but it also triggered multiple mudslides and the scars of record-breaking wildfires from years prior. Here are the details. Caltrans officials said thunderstorms triggered multiple mudslides over the weekend, closing roads in Northern California's Plumas County. There is no estimated time for the roads to reopen. The slide happened in last year's Dixie Fire burn scar area. The mudslides came after the southern edge of a storm system over the Pacific Northwest delivered heavy rain north of Sacramento. The National Weather Service said that between one to three inches of rain fell over portions of Plumas County between noon and 6 p.m. Sunday. Plumas County's 10-year average rainfall sits at 0.9 inches. Caltrans said the mudslides have closed a nearly 50-mile stretch of Highway 70 since Sunday. The closure extends between the Jarbo Gap in Butte County and the Greenville Y in Plumas County. California Highway Patrol spokesperson Andrew Haskins said little sections of the burn scar just kept flowing down. It was just pouring rain when the slides were coming down. The closure sits on the scar of the Dixie Fire, the largest single wildfire in California history. The fire burned from summer into fall last year. 
The California Highway Patrol Quincy Division hopes the highway reopens by Friday. Staying in California, raging wildfires are part of life for many in the Golden State. And now, even before a blaze erupts, one power company says they may have to shut the power off to keep everybody safe. NTD's Jackie Rios has more. We all take electricity for granted. The food in our freezer stays frozen, the light turns on in an instant, and for many of us, electricity even powers our cars. So why is Southern California Edison turning off the power voluntarily? We talked with one Edison official to find out the answer. Keeping the power up is not always as easy as one may think. Power suppliers have to face a wide range of weather and disasters in California, from extreme Santa Ana winds to earthquakes and wildfires. A representative talks about what leads to this public safety power shutoffs or PSPS. Leading into a PSPS event, that is based on the weather forecast as well as our meteorologists and our weather stations and our people on the ground surveying what the ground conditions are and the winds. Southern California Edison, or SCE, will initiate a power shutoff in a designated area to prevent the electrical system from becoming the source of the fire. A PSPS is not to be confused with a blackout. We have meteorologists working for us who use sophisticated weather data and models in order to forecast expected conditions. But in addition, we also have people in the field monitoring and verifying real-time conditions. In addition to the meteorologists and the people on the field, we also have up to 1,500 weather stations. Castro said if there's a fire risk in the area and there's enough concern, then SCE would initiate a public safety shutoff in order to keep the community safe. Power lines from state electricity suppliers have sparked wildfires in the past. Trimming back the vegetation around our infrastructure also helps mitigate against these risks because it removes the dry brush around the lines, eliminating the fuel source that any potential sparks would need to come in contact with to cause an ignition. Another safety measure has been to install cover conductors. Covered conductor is highly effective against wind-driven hazards such as contact from objects. It is less effective against fall-ins, which is larger risk in forested areas. So covered conductor reduces the risk of debris causing sparking when coming into contact with our lines by insulating the wiring. One example of that debris is falling tree branches. So far, Southern California Edison has installed over 2,500 miles of covered conductors. Jackie Rios, NTD News, Los Angeles. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ndd.com. And coming up at the hallowed courts of Wimbledon, a 23-time major champion will make her grand return. NTD's Dave Martin breaks down who Serena Williams' toughest competitor will be. And is China's zero COVID policy really for the well-being of the people? A new report suggests otherwise. That and more after this short break. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? 
In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. You're not gonna get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at mhtsa.gov slash the right seat. In every country, communism gains power. Authoritarianism and death followed in its wake. As an investigative journalist, I want to understand why. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. WNBA star Brittany Griner's detention in Russia has been extended through July 2nd, according to Russian news agency TASS. Griner has been held there since February 17, after Russian authorities say they found vape cartridges containing cannabis oil in her luggage at a Moscow airport. Griner's case was classified by U.S. authorities as wrongfully detained back on May 3rd, which meant they were attempting to negotiate her release. Meanwhile, the release of Marine veteran Trevor Reed in a prisoner swap the week before gave hope that Griner could be next. Griner's detention has already been extended several times before. In March, it was reported that her stay was extended to May 19th. On May 13th, it was extended again, this time for a month. The 6'9 Griner plays her off-season in Russia where she earns in excess of a million dollars a season, roughly four times her WNBA salary. Griner, a star for the Phoenix Mercury, has won an NBA title, an NCAA championship, and a pair of Olympic gold medals. The WNBA season started back on May 6. In tennis news, 23-time Grand Slam champion Serena Williams will play at Wimbledon later this month. Williams, who hasn't played since getting injured during last summer's Wimbledon, was awarded a wild card entry to the famous tournament she's won seven times before. Williams hinted at the return on Instagram when she posted a picture of her white shoes on grass with the caption SW and SW19, it's a date. SW19 is a postal code for the All England Club while SW are her initials. The 40-year-old first won the event back in 2002 and prior to last year's injury has made the finals each of the previous four times she's played there. She probably won't be the favorite to win an eighth title though, as long as number one ranked Iga Swiatek is in the field. The 21-year-old has won 35 straight matches, including the French Open, for a second title at Roland Garros. The winning streak is one longer than what Williams strung together in 2013 and equals what her sister Venus accomplished in 2000, the longest streak of the new millennium. And the Red Bull Daredevils are at it again. This time with a free-running competition entitled Red Bull Art of Motion 2022. The event took place on the rooftops of Vestapalia Island in Greece over the weekend. 16 athletes from around the globe partook in the three-day event showcasing their daring skills in a gravity-defying show. The first event was called the Exploration Challenge, where athletes created three videos of their best jumps and flips. Next, the Spot Challenge saw athletes attempt never-been-seen-before rooftop jumps. The finals was called the Live Challenge, where competitors had three attempts to complete their best trick in less than 10 seconds. Athletes were judged for creativity, difficulty, flow, execution, and overall performance. The UK's Travis Verkaik won the men's challenge, while America's own Sydney Olsen took first in the women's competition. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And over to China. If you wondered before if there was another motive behind China's strict zero COVID measures, you might be right. According to a new report, it looks like Beijing's COVID prevention measures are also a means to subjugate the Chinese people. Hundreds of people had their health QR codes changed to red by Chinese authorities, likely because they were planning a protest, not because they had COVID. The QR codes are part of China's virus contact tracing system. 
They alert users and authorities when a person comes in close contact with an infected person. So if your QR code is red, you will lose access to public transportation and the right to travel across the country. Imagine having your proof of vaccination invalidated just because you wanted to attend a demonstration. NTD's Don Ma reports. Starting about two months ago, three banks in China's central Henan province froze a number of their customers' money, totaling over $178 million. The banks won't say why it's frozen or for how long, other than that they were upgrading internal systems. It's left companies unable to pay workers and individuals unable to access savings. And this week, hundreds of people who are affected plan to go to Henan province to protest. But according to Reuters, their plans were thwarted after authorities turned their health QR codes red. It takes away their ability to use public transport and the right to travel across the country. Frank Gaffney, head of Center for Security Policy, says he was doubtful from the very start that China's zero COVID policy was purely for the sake of people's well-being. I don't believe from the beginning, and certainly not today, uh, is the zero COVID exclusively about public health, and probably not even substantially about public health. Those affected suggested to Reuters that their health codes were changed to red, not because they came into contact with COVID, but because they were planning a protest. It's very much uh, out of the playbook of the Chinese Communist Party to use whatever opportunity presents itself to strengthen the party at the expense of uh, any possible uh, opposition. Whether it's called a digital health passport, a vaccine passport, or something else, it is about uh, the party being able to maximize its totalitarian hold on the people of China and uh, manipulating them, bending them to their will. Mr. Chen, a customer of one of the banks, says it feels like they are putting digital handcuffs on us. Another customer, factory owner Mr. Chang, cannot access his nearly $1 million deposit. In his words, not being able to withdraw money has a huge impact on the operation of our factory, including procurement and workers' wages. Don Ma, NTD News. And in Britain, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson defended the government's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda as the first flight was expected to depart this evening. He accused lawyers representing migrants of undermining the government's efforts to stop illegal and dangerous migration. And TD's Joy Duguid has the details. Prime Minister Boris Johnson rejected criticism of the plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda and accused lawyers representing migrants of abetting the work of criminal gangs. And what is happening uh, with the attempt to undermine the Rwanda policy uh, is that they are, uh, I'm afraid, uh, undermining everything that we're trying to do to support safe and legal routes uh, for people to come to the UK and to oppose the illegal and dangerous routes. The plans have been challenged in the courts and condemned by the Church of England's senior bishops. The Prime Minister told his cabinet that there was a huge amount of attack aimed at the policy, but the government was determined to deliver it. Uh, my message to everybody today is that we are not going to be in any way uh, deterred or abashed by some of the criticism that is being directed upon this policy. Earlier on Tuesday, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss said the first flight removing asylum seekers to Rwanda will take off no matter how few people are on board. Well, I'm sure there will be some people on the what flight. What just one? I'm not sure how many, how many at this stage, but the point is that we want to establish the principle of this route. Uh, we need to make sure that people are going to Rwanda and we break the business model of these people traffickers. The Foreign Secretary did not deny estimates that a charter flight could cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, but insisted the scheme is both legal and value for money. Uh, it's a key part of our strategy for tackling the appalling people smugglers who are trading in people's hopes and dreams and in many cases costing their lives. So this is why it's vitally important that we press forward with this policy. And if people aren't on the flight today, they will be on subsequent flights. Ministers had initially planned for up to 130 people to be on the first flight, 
but because of the last-minute legal challenges, only seven or eight are due to be removed on Tuesday evening. Three further challenges brought by individuals who face removal are expected to be heard at the High Court on Tuesday. Joy Dugid, NTD News. And staying in Britain, the university's minister says Confucius Institutes in the UK will be required to declare their funding. Partnerships with such institutes may be closed if they are found to be restricting free speech. Confucius Institutes are promoted as global education programs imparting Chinese language and culture, but they are known to actually promote Chinese Communist Party propaganda. The institutes operate on campuses across the UK and beyond. Here's NTD's Jane Werrell with more. Following pressure from MPs who are concerned that Confucius Institutes are censoring views critical of the Chinese regime, the government proposed a change in the law that's aimed to protect free speech on UK campuses. These Confucius Institutes are controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. MP Alicia Kearns, who had tabled an amendment, warned that universities are being weaponised. Our students, our kids, our under-18s are being taught Mandarin by Confucius Institutes, which are the arm of the Chinese state. Confucius Institutes are supervised by the Chinese Communist Party, by the Ministry for Education. They are not allowed to hire teachers unless they have been vetted by the Chinese Communist Party. I have recently discovered that Edinburgh University's Confucius Institute has representatives of the Chinese Communist Party's embassy on its board. Yeah, we do. We this do. is absolute outright political it's intervention. They are not allowed to cover issues such as Taiwan or Tibet that apparently are sensitive. This is deeply concerning. Lancaster University, Edge Hill University, these are two universities that rely on CIs to provide teaching for undergraduates. We cannot allow a hostile power to capture our education provision. British students deserve a choice and they should not be forced to learn a language through the prism and narratives of a genocidal regime. And that is what we are trying to do here. We are not anti-China, it is about resilience within our system. The university's minister set out changes to the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill, which means that UK Confucius Institutes need to declare funding and their partnerships could be terminated. She says it will protect universities from undue foreign influences that work against British values. Indeed, New Cross 2 also requires the reporting of funding from certain overseas educational partnerships, including Confucius Institutes. Sweden cut ties with Confucius Institutes in 2020 and later the then US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that Confucius Institutes were an entity advancing Beijing's global propaganda and a malign influence campaign. This UK bill is now due to go to the House of Lords for further scrutiny. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. And over in Ukraine, Russian troops control about 80% of the fiercely contested eastern Ukrainian city of Sievredonetsk and have destroyed all three bridges leading out of the city. It's a potential turning point for what Kyiv calls the key battle for the eastern Donbass region. Here's NTD's Eddie Aitken with this report. Ukraine said on Tuesday its forces were still holding out inside the key city of Sievredonetsk in the eastern Donbass region. A day before, Ukraine's military acknowledged for the first time that Russia's military had taken over most of the city. This came after Russia had destroyed the last three bridges out of the city in a potential turning point in one of the war's bloodiest battles. Ukrainian forces acknowledged a threat that they could be encircled. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that Russian and Ukrainian forces are fighting for every meter of the territory. Last week, he said the strategic city could dictate the outcome of the conflict. About 12,000 people remain in the city compared to its pre-war population of 100,000. The governor of the eastern Luhansk region acknowledged that the mass evacuation of civilians from the city is now simply not possible due to the relentless shelling and fighting in the city. Ukraine has issued increasingly urgent calls for more Western heavy weapons to help defend Severodonetsk. Both sides claim to have inflicted huge casualties in the fighting over the city. It's Russia's main target in its battle for the east of the country after it failed to capture Kiev in March. Russian officials have signaled that a key goal of the invasion is to connect the Crimean Peninsula with the Donbass region, which borders Russia. Moscow has pulled back most of its forces from western Ukraine and the Kiev region in a bid to take more territory in the eastern and southern portions of the country. 
Russia said it would give Ukrainian fighters holed up in a chemical plant inside the city a chance to surrender on Wednesday morning. Ukraine says more than 500 civilians are sheltering in the plant. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. Coming up, a famous river in Albania is one step closer to having protected status. It's said to be one of the last wild rivers in Europe. And locals say any hydropower development in the area would cause irreparable damage. And a Scottish student is taking stunning photographs of faraway galaxies from the comfort of his backyard. Find out more after the break. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you get one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and you get a second set absolutely free. Or my six piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or get my classic premium My Pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com and use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all My Pillow products. The Vajosa River in Albania is a step closer to getting protected status after the government agreed to come up with a plan for a national park. It's said to be one of the last wild rivers in Europe and was under threat from the development of hydroelectric power plants, which locals say would spoil the area's natural beauty. NTD's Joy Dugut has this report. Albanian officials on Monday declared the Vjosa River and its tributaries a future national park a move aimed at preserving what they called one of the last wild rivers in Europe. The Albanian Ministry of Tourism and Environment signed an agreement with California-based Patagonia to draft an integrated and sustainable plan for the new park. The organization Patagonia has what we need more than anything else, which is knowledge and experience. The experience. Ryan Gellert of Patagonia told the Associated Press the move was an opportunity to protect one of the crown jewel rivers of Europe. What I did learn when I came here five years ago about that time was that across all of Europe, every river system has been dammed or channelized and in some other ways degraded. Patagonia is working with environmental groups on the project. The Vioza River runs 170 miles from the forest-covered slopes of the Pindus Mountains in Greece to Albania's Adriatic coast. It has popular spots for walking, bathing and swimming. Scientists say the Vioza ecosystem is the habitat for 1,100 species, 13 of which are in great danger of extinction. It also has ecological, cultural and economic value for the 60,000 Albanians who live along its shores. Local residents welcome the plan to preserve the natural beauty of the area. If this natural beauty gets damaged, we will desert this place day by day. But if we invest here by building hotels and resorts, our economy will grow. That's the only way to do it. Prime Minister Edi Rama said the government has cancelled its building plans for eight hydropower stations on the Vioza and its tributaries. Environmentalists say the dams would have caused serious damage to the river. Local residents feared it would leave them with less water for their crops and livestock, although it would have produced electricity for the small Western Balkan country. Neither the government nor the environmental groups could immediately say exactly how large the new park will be, but Rama said it would be Albania's biggest. Joy Dugid, NTD News. 
And now, looking up to the skies, people think that only NASA and giant telescopes can take a closer look at the galaxies. But a Scottish student busts the myth and captures stunning images of stars thousands of light years away. Finally. Night time. Meet Brian Shaw, a media student who works night shifts at Tesco. I always see everyone's life as like a kind of adventure. Brian is a huge space fan. I think when you're looking up, you feel you're, you're like exploring something that no one really knows is out there. He captures faraway galaxies on his camera whenever the night sky is clear. And when the pandemic hit, he was struck with a great idea. Start doing something a bit bigger that I never thought we'd do before. Since he couldn't spend his vacation money, Brian decided to invest in a telescope. He built a magnificent setup in his backyard. I feel sort of like a child again. I think as a child, you're always kind of wondering what's out there. Like you, that I, a lot of children, like, I want to be an astronaut, I want to do this. Raised in New Cumnock, Scotland, Shaw likes gazing at the sky after a stressful day. But it's really, it's calming to the nerves and it's enjoyable because the night sky, it always changes. So we've got seasons such as like we've got nebula seasons, galaxy seasons, and throughout the year, and it always changes. Astronomy and astrophotography might seem daunting, but some people manage to get amazing images using their smartphones. So the fact now that I'm able to capture images that people don't that people don't realise that an average person like myself can capture, because everyone thinks you know it's NASA, it's Hubble, it's like these big fancy telescopes and like universities that capture it, but. I work at Tesco and I'm a student and I'm able to capture this in my back garden. It's open to everyone. Shaw's secret to astrophotography is exposing the image of a constellation for as long as possible. This allows the camera to capture details that the naked eye can't see. To be able to do long exposure, Brian is using an equatorial mount for his camera and telescope. It locks onto a target and tracks it through the night sky as the Earth rotates. It allows him to take 15-minute pictures, and they are amazing. People were like, that's like insane how you can shoot a galaxy that we see as a star. Astrophotography is now a lifestyle for Brian. When the night sky is clear, he grabs his gear and drives to a dark field to take more pictures. The first image I put up, I wasn't happy with. Like, I know I could have done better. But the feedback from people and the people that were asking questions about it and the amount of kind of interest it peaked from people I found kind of it blew my mind. So he decided to share the magnificence of the universe with the rest of the world. He posts his images on Instagram and on a web page called The Nebula in Bloom. He's even considering publishing a calendar starring nebulae and galaxies. An impressive undertaking with impressive results. Well, that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's